Welcome back to the course in nuclear medicine physics. Today we're looking at something really exciting, SPECT imaging. SPECT imaging you could think of as a type of in vivo radiation detection. You inject a patient with radiation, you put them in a scanner, and you want to know how much radiation is inside your patient in different regions. Now this is where you get into the word SPECT. SPECT stands for Single Photon Emission Computed Tomography. So the important part of that word is single photon. You have a radioactive substance that decays inside your patient and emits single photons. And you want to detect those single photons to get a good idea of what the radiation concentration looks like inside the patient. This really isn't an easy task and a lot of things have to come together for this to work. You have to have really clever design of your detector so you can detect the photons in a specific way. You also have to have really clever mathematical algorithms to take in that data from your detector and turn it into a 3D image of what the radiation looks like inside a patient. In this lecture, we'll look specifically at the design of the radiation detector and all the necessary components that you need in order to take a proper scan. All right, so we're going to talk about SPECT imaging today, single photon emission computer tomography. We're gonna to divide this into two parts. We're gonna talk about concepts and designs, and in the next lecture, we're gonna talk more about um, quantitative aspects of PET imaging. Um, so as just mentioned, SPECT uh, stands for Single Photon Emission Computer Tomography. It is one of two major tomographic uh, modalities, imaging modalities in nuclear medicine, the other being uh, PET, which we will talk about in the future. And we've sort of alluded to the basic concept actually multiple times, but today we're gonna sort of go through this uh, more systematically. So essentially what you have are 2D projections. So again, think of a gamma camera, which is typically been the most common approach to this, though there are more advanced or more fancy solutions to this, which we'll talk about. So a planar uh, gamma camera obtains 2D projections. Let's call them X and Y, you know, Y being along the axial direction, along, you know, this direction, and X being this direction, for example. Um, and then you're collecting these at multiple angles, and this has to ideally cover, you know, at least, uh, you know, span 180 degrees around the subject. Uh, many times they also do 360. In the past, we said why 180 is sufficient, but also 360 is done. And so you're doing X and Y coordinates in the projection and theta being the angle of the uh, gamma camera. And then these are reconstructed in the 3D images which we typically label X, Y, and Z. X, Y, and Z here are not, you know, the X and the Y here is not the same as the X, Y here. These are just coordinates. So these are coordinates for a 3D image, whereas the X and Y here are coordinates for a planar uh, gamma camera and theta is the angle. So that's a tomographic image reconstruction, which we had a lecture about in the previous um, session. And again, so the 3D images can be viewed in, in 3D format. So you could do volume, viewing, you could do, meaning like you kind of render it, like you could do volume rendering, surface rendering, or more commonly, you know, uh, the clinicians go through them slice by slice. Uh, for example, along the transaxial slices or coronal or sagittal slices. And if you're doing cardiac imaging, you could actually take the image and reorient the heart along the different axes of the heart, etc. cetera. Um, so, um, Again, commercial spec systems have been typically based on the gamma camera. They've utilized one, two, or three heads, more commonly with par parallel hole collimators. And we've shown this um, slide before. Here's an example of a dual head um, uh, imaging where you know, we're, we're showing just rotations you know, at you know, positions one, two, three, four on both sides, but in real reality, you do far more angular sampling. This is just a sort of an oversimplified demonstration that you're obtaining you know, the X and Y coordinates of the projections uh, for this head at, let's say, four positions, and for this head, let's say, at four positions. But again, sampling is far more. For example, you may sample, uh, you may divide 180 degrees into every three degrees, okay? Um, and the point of having more than one uh, 
uh, more than one detector head is so you're, you're you're collecting more counts. You're doubling the collection capability or tripling it, right? And so that gives you better sensitivity. And or with the same sensitivity, you could uh, you could be uh, obtaining uh, faster acquisitions. Um, so yeah, so this this is. This can be done using continuous sampling, you know, the camera just gradually moving, or far more commonly doing step and shoot, you know, let's say here, another three degrees, another three degrees, another three degrees, okay? So step and shoot. And so again, 2D planar images record the projection data and the camera is rotated to obtain the full data set. So just to get us again, a sense for this, let's look at a video here. Enter the spec imaging room here. This is the control room where many of us as physicists spend a good amount of time trying different protocols, observing patients, doing phantom studies or running phantom studies. And here are, for example, just some examples of uh, you know the different ways these 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 heads could be uh, could be placed, right? There's many different ways. You could even have a case where the patient is standing here, right, uh, or patient lying down like that. But more commonly, what you have is let's say 90 degree, uh, for example, relationship. We could do 182, right? But in this example, in this camera being shown, you got 90 degree dual head, 90 degree, and again, you could be placing this above the patient, and, or you could be having it you know, below the patient, and then you could be rotating, you could have different angles, just many different options of doing this. This is the bed here, and this bed can move all the way in, and this is for support as it moves in. The patient could be head in, could be feet in, There's many different possibilities, many different ways of doing this. There's the rotation. Again, could be continuous rotation, could be step and shoot. Okay, so that was one. That was one example. Um, yeah, so, and then in, once you have those, those uh, the data collected, let's say around the patient, then you could be doing reconstruction using filter back projection, which we talked about last time, or iterative image reconstruction, which we also alluded to. Um, okay. So now, there are some spatial resolution concerns with the gamma camera, which we've talked about this extensively again in the past, uh, but essentially what, what you're having is that um, as you move away from the face of the collimator, your resolution is degrading. Um, you know, th this same object, you could think of it as an extended object or even a point source, uh, would give you an ex more extended image. So, so the resolution here is degraded and therefore the uh, ability to resolve objects, for example, would be degraded as you move away from the collimator uh, head. Okay, so that's obviously a, a problem. So of course, to, to address that, you could you know, play with the, with, with the design of the camera, but besides those considerations, playing with you know, a number of things like collimator design, the only physical way to improve, to improve spatial resolution is to actually get closer to the source, right? So this has uh, led to designs where you get closer to the patient so instead of like, let's say rotating at a, you know, uh, like along the path of a, you know, circular orbit, you could do like a contoured orbit where you try to get closer to the patient, for example, in this orientation. So these are definitely possibilities to improve, to improve uh, spatial resolution. However, still you do have the problem that even though the resolution is getting better, but this point, for example, a point here is being 
resolve better than a point here for this particular angle. But then there are reconstruction methods and algorithms uh, that can uh, sort of improve this uh, detector or collimator uh, uh, problem, the distance dependent resolution because of the collimator blaring uh, with reconstruction. And in our next lecture, we will talk about that. So, and there are some interesting and novel spec systems that, that kind of uh, uh, transcend the, the, the typical way of doing spec imaging. And so, so innovative people, you know, creative people, driven people like yourself, you know, coming out with, with new designs. So some of the common or some of the interesting themes have been to, to move beyond using sodium iodide and to, 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 to move towards semiconductor detectors like CZT, which, which Carlos, for example, talked about, and also some interesting and novel designs and geometries, okay? And you could consult our uh, chapter 14 in our textbook uh, for some of the details there, but we will go over some of them here. So solid state detectors or semiconductor detectors, um, you know, Carlos talked about this, but there are a number of advantages to them uh, compared to, uh, you know, conventional or typical, you know, scintillation, scintillation designs. Uh, so, so you could get better energy resolution. Okay, that's one of the really key advantages there. They, 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 they do not have a need for PMT, so they're less bulky. They're not, unlike sodium iodide, they're not hygroscopic. So humidity is not a problem and you don't have to worry about those aspects. And also, um, even though the effective Z or Z is the same, almost the same, but they, they can have higher density. This means that you're gonna have a higher linear attenuation, higher stopping power, meaning they, they can be more sensitive. So better energy resolution, less bulky, not hygroscopic, not sensitive to, to humidity and more sensitive to counts, okay? So these are all advantages. Um, so the trade-off has been the cost and those are things that, you know, the cost is coming down. Uh, so again, we, we showed this table in one of the prior lectures. Look at the effective Z for sodium iodide. We showed uh, other scintillators for PET too, but let's focus on the SPECT and the gamma camera sodium iodide. The effective Z you see is 51. Uh, it's the same for CZT, it's uh, around 50, uh, but the density, is lower here, whereas for CZT density is around six, so better uh, stopping power, right? So we have a question, how does energy resolution relate to spatial resolution? So, yeah, so, I mean, there's many different kinds of resolution, right? So uh, energy resolution uh, highly depends on the kind of a, a crystal that you're having, for example, uh, whereas spatial resolution, uh, depends a lot on collimator design, but collimator design, so they do interact. They do interact with each other. Well, we've had kind of uh, extensive discussions about, about you know, what are the various factors contributing to spatial resolution and what are some of the things that contribute to energy resolution? Um, so, so I'm happy to discuss that more, but we can also go back to some previous lectures. Okay, so here we have, um, uh, some interesting designs like the multi-pinhole collimator uh, design. And we talked about this before in the context of uh, uh, different uh, collimators. So here's an example where this is actually kind of a cool design because first of all, it's CZT based. And this so-called ASEAN technology is, is, allows you to do stationary, um, have a stationary system. Meaning unlike conventional uh, paradigm, Nothing is moving, which is quite impressive because if nothing is moving, that actually means you might have better temporal resolution. You could, you could even look at the dynamics quite more straightforward because if you wanna look at the dynamics of what's happening in the body and the camera doesn't have to move, then you could do faster acquisition, for example, and observe how things are changing. And the catch is because you have this pinhole design, you can look at the, for example, the heart from many, many different angles, you could sample the heart from many different angles. And so this effectively becomes a fancy way to do tomographic imaging. Um, another another um, uh, interesting design has been this, where again, patient's not lying down here. Uh, it's a semi upright position. This is dedicated cardiac imaging. And you're focusing on this thing, this kind of a, uh, uh, 
detector head, we have nine of them, by the way, in the system. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's a detector head that has CZT detectors and, and a collimator. Uh, and as it's here, it can rotate. It, it does rotate, right? So, so it's not stationary. It is rotating, but it's not like the whole system is rotating around you. You have these sort of, uh, you know, these, these rods or these blocks or these heads that are here and you just rotate them like this, right? And that allows you to sample different positions, different, uh, from different angles. And that, again, is kind of cool because again, you don't have to, you're not moving the, the, you know, the entire hardware, you're just moving uh, these detector heads within this structure here. And then the, you know, this concept has also been extended to whole body imaging. Uh, and so I'm gonna show you, show, show you a video of that. Um, and it also take note how it allows you to now get close to the patient more and more. So let's look at this together. So whole body CZT based spec. And this is what's, what's quite different. These detector heads can literally come close to the patient adjust themselves. And just watch here. And come really close. And here you've got the detector heads that can. So you can rotate physically the whole thing here, but also within it. Look here, within each of these, the detectors are rotating. So you're sampling at different angles within each of these, there could be rotation and these as a whole could also be rotating. So you could be focusing on different areas. You could be doing uh, sampling from many angles to allow tomographic imaging. So these kind of novel designs allow you to get, uh, you know, really high sensitivity imaging with, with pretty good resolution. you're focusing on what, you know, let's say you're focusing on, you know, the structure, the organ of interest. And also, um, and, and, you know, we've learned that, that um, one of the beauties of the gamma camera is that, uh, or the concept of uh, single photon imaging is that you could have multiple different kinds of tracers, each with different energies. Let's say you've got iodine 123, technetium, uh, thallium, et cetera. And you could be putting energy windows around the photo peaks of each of these. And so you could be doing simultaneous, you know, multi-isotope imaging uh, inspect uh, quite naturally, very naturally actually, right? Um, and so you could do multiple. I mean, in this example, they're talking about, you know, up to five radio tracers and the image reconstruction can, uh, can handle that. That's good. So um, yeah, so here's, that was one example. Um, and also, you know, let me, let me show, you, show you some other examples. You know, even with conventional uh, rotating gamma camera designs, so just conventional rotating gamma camera designs, there have been a number of notable improvements towards, let's say, dedicated cardiac imaging. Uh, um, an interesting example is so-called Siemens IQ spec, where, you know, okay, so this is conventional imaging here. You've got parallel hole collimators and it's you know, centered in the field of view. But in this approach, you're actually centering the rotation around the heart. So it becomes cardiocentric. And also they have this kind of a special um, collimator that can be uh, used where it's kind of like a converging collimator, but not exactly. It's converging towards the heart but it is not cutting off the edges. So, it, so it's more like a parallel hole collimator towards the end and more like a converging one towards the center. So kind of an interesting concept where you are you're still covering the same field of view, but you're putting more focus. Um, yeah, so you're doing more focus. Um, 
And yeah, so so these allow you to as you do as you do higher sensitivity imaging, so that can lower you know scan durations and things like that. Um, so again, just you remember we said in the past people are not using converging columnaries as much. Well, you know, uh, creative people like you come along and say, well, why not use a mixture, right? This is what the people did exactly here, right? Why not do a mix of converging and you know, cone beam converging and, you know, parallel hole in this weird, interesting uh, new design. Uh, here's another interesting design where the patient's sitting upright. You've got triple heads. This is the Digirat Cardias, uh, Cardias 3 XPO. And so here you, you still have, you know, conventional scintillators, sort of. I think this one is not sodium iodide, this one is cesium iodide, but, but it's not coupled to PMTs. It's not coupled to PMTs, it is coupled to um, silicon photodiode. So, so Carlos gave a talk on, you know, on approaches beyond uh, PMTs, right? So for example, using silicon photomultipliers. And look, the chair rotates. Remember I told you in one of the previous lectures, you know, I went to this center where they said, well, why don't we rotate the chair? Because that was so straightforward for them. They didn't have these capabilities. Well, guess what? You know, uh, people came up with this idea in state of the art technology where they're saying, we're going to fix this, the patient's sitting, we're going to rotate the chair. And that's actually what's being done. And then you could also add, uh, you could also add uh, X-ray source for attenuation correction in which they have for one of their models. So a question that arises is, is spec, so for these different designs, can, is spec quantitative? And can it be made more quantitative? Or can it be made quantitative? And actually, what is meant by quantitation? And that is exactly what, what we will talk about in the next lecture. Mm -hmm.